Uh, well, I am very thankful to uh, the organizers uh, for asking me to uh, talk here. Uh, I gave a somewhat ambitious title, uh, which was, uh, I think, I don't remember what the title was. I think it was Theory of uh, uh, Linear Resistivity in Strongly Correlated. Uh, then I found that, uh, well, that was beyond me, well beyond me. Uh, so I have simplified the title. And uh, actually, the title is now Linear Resistivity in Metals. You can even forget the word linear, because it is generally linear anyway. Huh? So let me uh, start. Yeah, so the first thing I want to say is that uh, linear resistivity is not a rarity. It is actually the most common thing, huh? except uh, in all metals, which are not dirty, uh, except at a very, very low temperatures, the resistivity is uh, linear in temperature. Uh, and uh, the um, sort of uh, theoretically and uh, experimentally uh, best studied example of that is uh, the, linear, the resistivity of uh, pure metals, mm. in which the resistivity is due to the scattering of uh, phonons by electrons. There are well defined uh, quasi particles, electrons, and so on. And uh, <clears throat> uh, this uh, resistivity, as is well known, uh, is uh, not linear at extremely low temperatures. It, it follows a fairly high power of temperature. It behaves as t power phi. Uh, but uh, at surprisingly low temperatures, it becomes linear in temperature, and it continues to be linear. And uh, the explanation given is that, uh, well, it is due to the scattering of electrons by uh, um, fluctuations of the positions of the ions. And uh, these fluctuations are uh, classical. Uh, and so uh, the resistivity is proportional to the average of uh, fluctuations. And that is uh, uh, proportional to KT by classical equipartition theorem. So it's actually a very general result. Uh, and, uh, uh, and actually, it is followed. The uh, slope uh, of this linear resistivity is not universal, uh, and, but it depends on the strength of the electron phonon coupling. But um, this is a very well known thing. Uh, but then uh, it turns out that there is a lot of excitement in this subject uh, in the last uh, 20 years. Uh, why is that? That is uh, partly because the size of the resistivity in many systems, which people have been studying, is extremely large. Uh, not only is it large, it is large over a very wide range of temperatures. Not only is it large over a wide range of temperatures, uh, it uh, exceeds uh, 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 some number. Uh, which uh, is embedded in our consciousness. Uh, it is called the uh, Mott of Regel limit. It is the quantum limit of resistivity. Mm. Uh, then uh, another reason why people are very excited about this uh, um, occurrence is uh, that um, uh, this phenomenon is uh, associated with electronic systems in which the uh, electrons seem to uh, interact strongly with each other. And uh, quite possibly, there are no good quasi-particles. So what I will do is uh, uh, just show lots of pictures of uh, data uh, which uh, exhibit this uh, linearity in the resistivity in a very wide variety of systems. Uh, then very briefly um, talk about uh, some classes of theoretical attempts. And at the very end, uh, say something about uh, my vague thoughts. OK. So, uh, the first thing, uh, I suppose, to uh, note is that uh, the uh, resistivity which, uh, uh, you know, the, the, this is the most common formula which most people use. Uh, this uh, uh, follows from Drude theory, Boltzmann transport theory, and so on. Uh, but uh, then, uh, if you believe all that, uh, but if you believe that the electron is a quantum mechanical particle, then it is uh, uh, obvious that there is a, a natural scale for resistivity. And uh, that natural scale is uh, when the mean free path, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, when the mean free path is of the order of the wavelength of the quantum mechanical particle. Uh, that uh, connection uh, gives you a characteristic quantum scale, uh, which uh, was first uh, uh, noticed by Joffe and Regel, uh, who argued that the smallest value which the mean free path can take is actually uh, something to do with the uh, 
uh, interatomic spacing in the material because <coughs> In order for the resistivity to, uh, to, to arise, uh, the thing has to collide with something, and that something is about a, a lattice spacing away. Hmm. Uh, then uh, Mott independently uh, thought of uh, a different criterion, which is that the wavelength of this quantum mechanical particle, this is the electron, uh, should be of the order of the uh, mean free path. Because if the, wavelength, if the mean free path is shorter than that, it is very difficult to think of uh, this. Uh, uh, electron as having a wave, being a good wave, being, have, having a wavelength and so on. So it's just, a, I would say, a kind of a, a general uh, um, order of magnitude argument. Uh, and uh, it turns out that uh, if you use this, uh, then for most metallic densities, both these criteria give you somewhat similar numerical values. Uh, and this numerical value is uh, uh, of the order of 0.2 uh, milliohm centimeters for typical metallic uh, densities. In two dimensions, uh, the same uh, number uh, is a resistance. And this number is uh, h by e square. It is uh, called the von Klitzing constant. Um, and uh, uh, it is known to uh, one part in a billion. Hmm? Uh, it is about 20, 28,000 ohms, 25,000, 26,000 ohms. OK. Uh, now, um, so there are many ways. When I began to look at it, uh, I noticed that there are many ways in which people uh, assume, uh, you know, come to this quantum scale of resistance uh, or resistivity. Uh, some people assume that the relation between the density, for example, suppose you believe in the Druda formula, uh, then uh, well, uh, you have something called the density there, electron density, and something called the mean free path. Now, you um, want to uh, make a connection between the uh, density, which is measurable, and the uh, Fermi wave vector, uh, which uh, you infer from it. Uh, well, uh, some people assume spinless electrons, some people assume spinful electrons, and uh, some people assume for the Mott criterion, the value KFL equal to 1, some people assume the value KFL equal to 2 pi. And depending on the assumptions, the obviously, the um, uh, quantum limit, quantum value, limiting values of the uh, resistivity vary. Hmm. And uh, well, I have listed various things here. But finally, what I say here is that uh, uh, if you take for a typical metal, the uh, Fermi wave vector to have this uh, size uh, and the lattice constant to have this size, then the uh, Mott uh, value is about 0.13 milliohm centimeter. The Yoffe Regel value is about the same, 0.12 milliohm centimeter. And uh, the, uh, in two dimensions, the uh, maximum metallic resistance is about 4.1 kilo ohm in the uh, Mott uh, way of uh, putting it, and is about 6 kilo ohm in the uh, Yoffe Regel way of putting it. Okay. Uh, so, does this resistivity, does this limiting resistivity mean anything? Well, uh, it does mean something because uh, uh, this, uh, for example, if you look at the resistivity of uh, um, a few metals and alloys, this is copper, this is niobium, this is niobium-3 antimony, uh, you find that uh, these resistivities increase with temperature. But uh, it is as if it is going to saturate to some value. This uh, resistivity also increases with temperature, and as if it, it bends over, as if it is going to saturate some value. And uh, that value uh, actually happens to be uh, the uh, Yoffe Regel limit in both cases. Okay, so uh, uh, in uh, this was the situation, let us say, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, people noticed that, uh, well, metals have linear resistivity, like, for example, copper has linear resistivity at high temperatures, and platinum has linear resistivity at high temperatures. But there are some other metals which also have resistivities which are linear at high temperatures, but they are very high. And if they are very high, they tend to saturate. Uh, it's as if they are going to saturate. Now, uh, this is actually still not well understood. Uh, there is a phenomenological model which uh, says that, look, Suppose the conductivity of the material were the sum of two conductivities, one uh, due to uh, the uh, sort of Druda way of thinking or the Boltzmann transport way of thinking, and uh, the other uh, some uh, uh, quantum limiting value, which I call 
the mod of a regular conductivity. Hmm. So if the conductivity is the sum of these two, uh, then uh, you can actually um, fit the data. Hmm. Uh, but why it works well, it is not very clear. Hmm. It's still not very clear. Uh, there are many attempts, uh, one of them I have mentioned here. Uh, but, uh, okay, when I uh, was sort of growing up, uh, this was a very big problem in uh, um, transport theory. Uh, but then it turns out that uh, around the same time, uh, people discovered that uh, there are a number of other systems in which the resistivities are even larger and uh, they don't saturate. And I think the first uh, uh, example of this kind is a measured example. Oh, sorry, I should go back. Uh, maybe. Oh, that's strange because I did, did want to uh, show the first example, which I'm not able to show. But this is from, all right. Oh, all right. That, I don't know why it is not coming here. But the thing which I wanted to show was the following that. Um, in um, uh, uh, Bismuth uh, uh, doped high TC superconductor, which is uh, uh, abbreviated as 2201, uh, whose uh, superconducting transition temperature could be 8 degrees, could be 6 degrees, could be 0 degrees. Uh, Martin, Fury, and others at Bell Labs found that uh, the resistivity, electrical resistivity from 7 degrees to 700, in, 700 degrees was linear in temperature. So 7 degrees is particularly low uh, because it is lower than, uh, I mean, its Debye temperature is of the order of uh, 400 or 300 degrees Kelvin. And uh, therefore, it is uh, much lower than, uh, I mean, suppose the resistivity were due to electron phonon scattering. Eh? then uh, you would expect, you would not expect the resistivity to become linear at a, low, a temperature as low as a few degrees. So this obviously meant that uh, some other mechanism causing resistivity was at work even at very low temperatures. And not only that, the very fact that uh, the same behavior of resistivity persisted over a very wide range of temperatures implies that uh, the same mechanism is uh, continues to be at work over this range of temperatures. Okay. Uh, then uh, uh, there was a, a very um, well-known uh, publication due to uh, work due to uh, Takagi, Batlog, and so on. Uh, they reported the resistivity of uh, 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 strontium doped lanthanum cuprate uh, for different values of doping of uh, um, strontium. And uh, they found, for example, as, I, as you can see here, uh, well, I mean, the resistivity is sort of linear. I mean, it, it, it does many things, but uh, then at reasonably high temperatures, it does become linear. And uh, this uh, uh, linear uh, part uh, seems to keep uh, growing. And uh, uh, in this figure there is uh, the uh, yaffe regal limit is not shown, but the yaffe regal limit is uh, uh, somewhere here. So this implies that the resistivity grows, uh, keeps growing linearly well beyond the quantum limit of uh, uh, its uh, value. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the same uh, uh, people's uh, data, but uh, shown over a wider uh, range of uh, Quantum doping. Okay. Now, uh, the, uh, the authors, that is Takagi and uh, Batlog and Kawa and so on, they tried to fit the uh, observed data to a single power law. And uh, they found that the power law which fits the data best is 1.5. And uh, there was a lot of talk about why it should be, etc. But a more recent uh, attempt to fit the data of uh, resistivity of uh, strontium doped lanthanum cuprate at different values of doping uh, attempts a different kind of fit, which is uh, some value at zero temperature plus some uh, linear term and a quadratic term. Hmm. And uh, uh, okay, I've shown the. Uh, data for three values of doping, 0 0.17, 0 0.2, and 0 0.26, uh, which sort of uh, 
goes from what is called optimal doping to sort of beyond optimal doping. Uh, if you want to look at uh, this particular part somewhat better, then you look at the derivative of this. And uh, when you look at the derivative, this is the derivative plotted as a function of temperature, uh, you find that uh, actually the linear part has a, a different uh, uh, limiting behavior at low temperatures and a, a, a different behavior at uh, high temperature. Uh, and at high temperatures, at least uh, in these systems, uh, it is clear, actually on all of these, it is clear that there is no uh, T square term. And uh, so this means that the resistivity is uh, linear in these systems. Uh, it has a, a different uh, slope of its linearity at high temperatures and a different slope at low temperatures. Well, at high temperatures, uh, the uh, linear uh, coefficient doesn't change with temperature, so it is linear. That's essentially what it implies. Okay, so this again, this shows the same thing, uh, sort of uh, the essence of the same thing, uh, namely that the it shows the linear coefficient as a function of doping. Uh, it shows how the low temperature linear coefficient varies with doping and how the high temperature linear coefficient stays constant with doping. Hmm. Uh, the, uh, uh, you can do many things. I mean, this one of the things you can do is this, uh, which is that you can take the ratio of these and you notice that the low temperature linear coefficient goes to zero uh, at a fairly high doping. Uh, this is uh, believed to be a kind of critical point where, well, at least in this uh, set of data, these two meet. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so this, uh, to me at least, this implies that uh, there is at least one other distinct mechanism for low temperature linear resistivity. And uh, uh, that uh, mechanism is uh, what uh, is, uh, uh, well, it is shown here. And uh, that seems to be connected with the superconductivity properties of the system. Mm. Uh, for example, here, the linear coefficient is uh, shown against the uh, penetration depth squared. Uh, or the superfluid density uh, in, on a, in a log log plot, and there uh, you notice that uh, they, they follow a you know, straight line. Over, for very different kinds of systems, uh, you know, uh, it could be a, a Q plate high T superconductor, uh, it could be uh, a heavy fermion superconductor, uh, it could be in some other unconventional superconductor. Uh, this also, this is another uh, picture which shows the same thing. It shows that uh, linear term, low temperature linear term, and uh, the superconducting uh, T and the correlation between the two. Okay, uh, so uh, they, the, these authors, namely uh, Cooper, Hussey, and so on, they also plotted uh, as a function of temperature. Uh, the uh, 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 logarithm of the, they plotted log rho t minus rho zero versus log t. This is what is uh, the, this is the plot. And this color plot shows uh, uh, different values of uh, uh, n in different colors. Uh, and you, one can see that uh, there is uh, one uh, low temperature regime, which is, uh, which extends over a rather wide range of uh, whole doping. And uh, there is uh, another uh, linear regime which uh, starts at a reasonably high temperature. Okay. Uh, all right. So what is the sort of conclusion from this? One is that uh, high temperature uh, non-saturating linear resistivity is endemic to uh, correlate. I mean, all right. This is what I'm going to say. Uh, going to show some pictures which say that. Uh, so far, all I have shown is that in some Q 
few plate high temperature superconductors, you do find uh, high, uh, linear resistivity at uh, high temperatures as well as at low temperatures. I mean, you, you can expose this low temperature regime, uh, for example, by applying a magnetic field and killing superconductivity. If you do that, then, uh, well, you, you get a certain kind of material uh, in which you find this uh, feature. Okay. Uh, my own uh, guess is that uh, the uh, uh, origin of the low temperature linear resistivity is somewhat different. Um, I will not talk about this particular thing, uh, but uh, focus, uh, try to focus more on the high temperature non-saturating linear resistivity, which I have shown for a few cuprate superconductors and which I am going to show for a few more uh, superconductors and non-superconductors. Okay. The uh, other thing which uh, I do want to mention is that the resistivity at high temperatures is not exactly linear, eh? is not generally, uh, not quite linear and uh, this could be due to many things. It could be due to something as trivial as the fact that the resistivity at constant pressure and the resistivity at constant volume are different. Uh, it could be due to the fact that uh, when you heat something, then oxygen escapes from it. Uh, it could be due to the fact that the thing melts or its structure changes. So I'll just show one, uh, uh, yeah, for example here. This shows the uh, data of, uh, uh, res data for resistivity versus temperature for a superconductor that is RB3C60. And uh, one sees here that the resistivity at uh, 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 constant uh, um, uh, volume pressure is this and the resistivity at constant volume is this. Firstly, the difference is quite large and secondly, the resistivity at constant volume is uh, much more linear. Okay, uh, now I show um, some pictures. This is from, I think, an article by, um, a talk by Subir Sachdev. Uh, this, is, this shows, for instance, that uh, uh, in this uh, nictide uh, superconductor, uh, the resistivity is linear over a wide range of temperatures above uh, Tc. Uh, this uh, uh, shows uh, again that uh, in a number of uh, cuprate superconductors, uh, the resistivity is sort of linear at uh, high temperatures, uh, going up to 1000 degrees. Uh, whereas the Joffre-Regel limit is here. So it goes well beyond the Joffre-Regel limit and, uh, um, well, continues. Uh, this temperature looks terribly high, but uh, actually on the scale of electronic temperatures, it is rather low uh, because the typical, I mean, typically, let us say, the nearest neighbor hopping energy for these systems is of the order of three to 4,000 uh, degrees. Okay, so this uh, here I have shown uh, the same occurrence of linearity for uh, two classes of superconductors. Uh, one is, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, one is uh, RB3C60. You see that uh, at uh, very low temperatures, indeed, there is a T square kind of behavior of the resistivity, which is expected for a a dirty Fermi liquid, uh, then there is a, a linear part of the resistivity which doesn't seem to uh, show any signs of saturation. Uh, for this system, because its uh, uh, lattice constant is rather large, uh, the uh, mott joffre regel limit is, uh, for resistivity is rather small. Uh, and you can see that the resistivities are much higher than that. Uh, this is again a picture from the same authors that is Fleming and Hebbard and Palstra. Uh, what it shows is the resistivity as a function of temperature for uh, two uh, different alkalis doping C60 uh, and uh, for one particular alkali for two different thicknesses. One notices that the slopes are almost exactly the same uh, over a wide range of temperatures. Uh, this uh, shows uh, for different uh, I mean, iron oxynictide, so different oxygen doping, uh, the resistivity as a function of temperature. Again, uh, you see a linear term. This shows uh, the same sort of thing for uh, uh, thallium, 
single layer thallium uh, ITC compound. Uh, this shows the resistivity as a function of temperature for uh, YBCO, which is a very uh, popular high temperature superconductor. This shows uh, the resistivity as a function of temperature uh, over again a fairly wide range over a thousand degrees or so for a strontium rudinate. Uh, strontium rudinate, um, by the way, is a, a sort of stated to be, and it is actually, I think, a mystery compound. Uh, in a recent article, it's uh, so said. Uh, now, it is uh, structurally similar to cuprate, but with rather low temperature. Uh, and the difference also is that, uh, um, you know, the parent compound is uh, metallic rather than, a, than, than insulating. Now, this was believed originally, I mean, it becomes superconducting at about a degree. Uh, it was originally believed to be a P wave superconductor, uh, uh, and this was uh, um, uh, pointed out by Rice and Sigrist and by Baskaran. Uh, at that time, uh, uh, you know, fair amount of supporting evidence was found from night effect and from the proximity of ferromagnetism and so on. But uh, people are not so sure anymore. Uh, it is a... Uh, uh, at, at, okay, at very low temperatures, it does seem to be very coherent, uh, like a very few degrees, but then above that, it becomes incoherent. Uh, it is quite possible that uh, because of the presence of ruthenium, uh, this is, uh, uh, there is some topological superconductivity in the system, in this system. Okay. Uh, yeah, here again, I show the same uh, substance, strontium ruthenate. Here I show SR3 uh, RU207, sorry. Uh, and uh, I show here the resistivity of uh, lithium molybdate, uh, molybdate a purple bronze, which is uh, another uh, peculiar compound, which is a monoclinic, very anisotropic. Resistivity is linear from 30 to 300K. Uh, all through the uh, divide temperature, the uh, MOT limit is about 150 uh, microns centimeter. Uh, so, uh, okay. Uh, uh, and so on. I mean, I think it gets uh, somewhat boring after some time. Uh, now, uh, in the last few years, uh, two very different systems have been um, uh, shown to have uh, linear resistivity. And uh, uh, one of them is uh, uh, a cold atom system. And uh, you notice that in this cold atom system, uh, through lots of tricks, you can actually uh, obtain the resistivity. I mean, you can even diffusion constant, then compressibility, resistivity, and so on. Uh, and uh, you find that uh, over a temperature, uh, which is several times the uh, presumed uh, uh, hopping uh, energy, nearest neighbor hopping energy, uh, eight times, uh, which uh, the resistivity is linear. So this is really astonishing because, uh, uh, you see, the resistivity is linear, uh, you see, on, uh, on the, the scale of cuprates, which I have talked about or shown so much, uh, the cuprates are somewhere here. The highest temperature you can get is uh, uh, maybe one-tenth of the, uh, or one-fifth of T. And here you find linearity uh, right up to 10 times T. So this is really amazing. Uh, similar uh, uh, data uh, have been obtained for uh, uh, twisted bilayer graphene. Uh, you notice that uh, for uh, different uh, hole densities here, as I've shown here, uh, I mean, sorry, different angles of twist, uh, the resistivity is linear in temperature. Uh, but uh, with uh, quite different slopes, and it keeps on being linear. Okay. So, uh, broadly, I feel that uh, uh, the resistivity is not only linear with temperature in uh, many, uh, of many systems, many meta metallic systems, it's large, it's linear over a very wide range of temperatures, uh, starting with unusually low temperatures, and uh, continuing on to the highest temperatures accessible in model systems, much higher temperatures are accessible, modern systems such as uh, cold atoms or twisted bilayer graphene. Uh, the, uh, in the cuprate language, I would say that uh, one is able to access temperatures from 7 degrees to 20,000 degrees, uh, which is about four orders of magnitude. Often, this resistivity is not perfectly linear, but it does not show any prominent signs of saturation. 
it is often considerably larger than the low temperature quantum estimates of Mott and of Yoffe and Regel, which seem to be reached at relatively low temperature. Then it seems to be associated with uh, the electron system not having well defined quasi particles. Now, this I have not um, said anything about, but uh, there, are, there is a lot of spectroscopic evidence that the, many of these systems uh, do not have well defined quasi particles. Uh, if it is a generic inevitable feature, then one would like to believe that there should be a similarly generic uh, theory. Well, we, I don't think we have it yet, but fine. Uh, though a quantum critical point is an attractive possibility, the fact that the uh, resistivity occurs in so many different kinds of systems for so many different kinds of uh, electron concentrations and so on seems to uh, be against uh, this possibility. Okay. So there are many, um, okay, now I'm coming to the end of my talk actually. Uh, there are many, at, uh, many attempts to make sense of this. Huh? And uh, uh, I will start with the most phenological one. The phenological attempt is to take the resistivity, sorry, uh, as measured, uh, multiply it with some factors uh, which uh, make it possible to plot this as a y-axis and then the Fermi velocity as the x-axis and uh, put a large number of different systems on this plot. And uh, this is sort of conventional metals uh, with electron phonon scattering. Uh, this is heavy fermion superconductors. Uh, and uh, you also have a, uh, you have a cuprate system, you have a nictide, uh, you have a uh, organic uh, so superconductor and so on. So all of them seem to follow uh, fall on a, that is the numbers for all of them seem to follow or uh, fall on a single curve. Uh, this uh, curve uh, seems to imply uh, a um, uh, lifetime which is uh, proportional to kt by h, h slash. Hmm. Uh, now, uh, the only place where you can make uh, actual calculations is uh, weak coupling uh, or at only place where you have people have made calculations is weak coupling. Uh, and uh, uh, there uh, it turns out that this uh, rate is uh, proportional to the square of the electron phonon coupling times this uh, um, hopefully universal number. I mean, this number is universal, but uh, uh, for this to be universal, uh, this has to be one for all the systems or very near one. Okay. So uh, let me. Uh, uh, okay, now uh, that's that. It is, that uh, attempt was uh, phenomenological. I mean, there is no theory behind it, uh, except the belief that uh, uh, the decay rate is universal and is given by uh, this uh, number KTB by KBT by H slash, which is called the Planckian dissipation limit. Uh, now there is a very large number of theoretical attempts. Uh, I. Honestly, do not know many of them. I do not understand many of them. And so I will just mention just a very few. Uh, one class of uh, theoretical atoms ba is based on DMFT, that is the dynamical mean field theory. And uh, in, in these uh, attempts, uh, you, you do basically, you assume a um, Hubbard-like model, that is a lattice model with uh, a single correlation, electron correlations on a single site. And, uh, uh, you uh, obtain a, a self-consistent uh, theory for uh, uh, such a lattice system. Uh, and uh, uh, in large dimensions, it turns out that the, the resistivity can be written only in terms of the single particle Green's functions. Uh, you use that fact. And uh, then uh, these people, these people meaning uh, Antoine George, Deng, Antoine George, Cotillard, and so on, uh, they uh, uh, used an algorithm for uh, uh, finding uh, the um, s solving the single site uh, quantum impurity problem, which enabled them to go to very, very low temperatures. Uh, and they found that the resistivity in units of the Morty of Feregel value uh, plotted as a function of uh, temperature in units of, uh, in this particular case, the nearest neighbor hopping, which is labeled D by them, uh, they found that the at very low temperatures, yes, the resistivity goes as T square. Uh, there are well-defined quasi-particles. I mean, there are signatures of well-defined quasi-particles. Uh, uh, but uh, 
at pretty low temperatures, the linearity of the resistivity sets in and doesn't seem to show any signs of uh, saturation. Uh, so, uh, they sort of uh, uh, summarized these findings in a plot uh, which shows uh, here uh, the uh, uh, sort of Fermi liquid regime for different values of uh, hole doping uh, as a function of temperature. Uh, in units of this uh, hopping amplitude. Uh, they so this is the sort of Fermi liquid regime. Then uh, there is a regime in, in which the resistivity is definitely linear in temperature. There doesn't seem to be any well-defined quasi-particles, also seen from the spectral density of the system uh, of the electron. Uh, and there is a fairly large uh, crossover regime from between one and the other. Okay, so this is what I have tried to summarize here. There is a large linear in temperature regime which starts at a pretty low temperature of the order of uh, um, one fifteenth of the um, hopping amplitude and continues to intermediate temperatures. There is a clear Fermi liquid regime for uh, rather low temperatures, and uh, you know uh, this is rather low. I mean, it, it uh, uh, seems to be because it's uh, very low in comparison to what is expected from uh, a well-known picture of the um, strongly correlated system uh, due to Brinkman and Rice, which is uh, good for large dimensions. So, for in that picture, it is expected that uh, one would have, one might have good quasi-particles well below uh, this uh, temperature range, where this is the hole doping and this is the uh, hopping amplitude. But uh, they found a very uh, substantially small compared to one numerical factor here. Mm. And they found that there is a large crossover regime. There is a large regime in temperature where the resistivity is much larger than the mod of a regal value. There is no tendency to uh, resistivity saturation. Mm. Uh, there are uh, uh, several calculations uh, in the sort of general um, world of DMFT. Uh, and uh, I will just show results from two of them. Uh, one is uh, uh, this calculation due to uh, Antoine George and Shiram Shastri. Uh, what uh, is shown here uh, is the numerical renormalization group results, uh, which are shown in, in these crosses and uh, diamonds. Uh, and uh, these, uh, these dashed lines and dotted lines uh, are the high temperature expansion results. Uh, the amazing thing is that the high temperature expansion results uh, are pretty good, even to rather low temperatures. Uh, there is a more recent uh, uh, work by Patel, uh, Cha, Gull, and Kim, uh, in which uh, uh, they um, do two things. Uh, one is uh, uh, DMFT with the exact generalization of a small uh, square uh, um, and uh, use that to calculate the resistivity over a, a range of temperatures. And uh, the other thing is an approximate calculation which is analytical in which the uh, um, spectral density is taken to be a Gaussian, is a sort of two Gaussians. Uh, and uh, the width of this Gaussian, the location, uh, and the area are uh, made consistent with the results of the dynamical mean theory. So that uh, calculation shows something uh, quite uh, remarkable. Uh, it shows that the resistivity keeps being linear over a range uh, of several hopping amplitude values. Mm. So which means, uh, again, a temperature which may be a few thousand degrees or so in uh, terms of the uh, cube rates. OK, there is another class of theories which is based on the limits on charge diffusion, that is the Planck and dissipation limit, uh, which uh, uh, basically uh, argues uh, that uh, uh, the thermal equilibration times of uh, systems which may or may not have quasi-particles, uh, or, or rather, systems which do not have quasi-particles, thermal equilibration times are of this order, uh, where uh, uh, C is a number of the order of 1. Uh, there is also a recent work which shows that uh, the uh, 
uh, you know, suppose you prepare the system in some state uh, and then you ask for the overlap at a time t later, uh, that uh, overlap decay decreases exponentially and uh, that uh, gives you a characteristic Lyapunov of time, which also is of the same uh, form but with a, a numerical constant which is of the order of 1. Mm. So this uh, line of thinking is actually very exciting because over. Okay, okay, I'll finish. I'm finishing. Uh, yeah, this uh, uh, is very exciting because of the strong connections uh, which this approach has with other fundamental questions in physics. Uh, now, what you do from here is uh, uh, not so uh, reliable. Uh, you go from here to uh, the diffusion constant, and uh, from the diffusion constant, you go to the conductivity via the Einstein relation. Okay. So then uh, there is this famous model due to uh, Sachdev, uh, Ye, and Kitaev, uh, SYK model, uh, where uh, uh, you know you basically have a very uh, uh, new kind of quantum dot uh, in which every particle, uh, there are lots of particles inside this quantum dot, every particle interacts with every other particle. And uh, now if you make a lattice of such quantum dots, it uh, gives you an incoherent metal with a small coherence temperature right? and uh, linear resistivity. So this is one uh, approach. Then there is another approach which uh, to me, um, uh, you know, I, I can only see, see the final results, uh, which is what is called the theory of extremely correlated Fermi liquids, uh, which is due to Shiram Shastri and others. Uh, this. Uh, is an approximation for a single particle Green's function using functional derivatives. Uh, and uh, if you know the single particle Green's function, it is enough to calculate resistivity. And uh, the claim made is that uh, there are several regions in temperature uh, which are shown here. There is a Fermi liquid regime. There is a, what is called the Gutzwiller correlated strange metal regime. There is a bad metal regime, and there is a high T metal. They all, I mean, in this regime, in these three regimes, the slopes are linear, but uh, the, I mean, the resistivity is linear, but the slopes are different. Uh, okay, so I will uh, stop there. Sir, at the very beginning of your talk, you tell about the quantum limit. Quantum unit, quantum limit. Yes. Is it in the Planck scale only? This is what? Planck scale, P L A N C K. Planck, yeah, uh, because it involves the Planck's constant. It has, yeah, that's right. Only, only in the yeah. Planck scale. It involves the Planck's constant. I mean, that's okay. It has to. Any other questions? Uh, Shastri's uh, extremely correlated uh, metal approach seems to take this Planckian aspect explicitly and uh, seems to be very good for above the bandwidth. So can you comment on that? Because many other approaches are less microscopic in some sense. Here he has an infinite u Hubbard model and that's what he could do at best. Then he gets linear resistivity over several bandwidths. Yeah, I, um, okay, I mean, I understand uh, very vaguely what is uh, done, mm -hmm. uh, which is a kind of uh, obtaining the single particle Green's function uh, through some functional derivatives of the um, energy and so on, free energy, uh, and then making some approximations for the uh, spectral density there, on-site spectral density, and then uh, using that uh, to uh, obtain resistivity. But uh, why the resistivity is linear and why is it linear with different slopes and different temperature regimes, uh, I don't quite understand. Because Sastri also has similar results for Hall angle at high. Yeah, yeah. that's it. So also, I mean, he's the sort of pioneer of this uh, high temperature expansion mm -hmm. in this field. And uh, the first result was, uh, um, that's it, AC Hall conductivity and Hall angle and so on. And uh, there again, the... Uh, uh, agreement with experiments in uh, um, that period was very good. Uh, here also the agreement is uh, quite good, but uh, here uh, I, I don't quite understand why it is so good. Any further question? Okay, I have one question. At you here. So this uh, cold atom, there is no phonons, right? I mean that. Uh, there are no phonons. Hopefully, why hopefully? I'm mean, really speaking. Yes, energy scales are so different. Okay. 
if there are no other questions, let's thank CVR. Oh, sorry. So it's in all of the theoretical approaches you mentioned, it seems as if the, uh, you can get regimes of linear resistivity, but it always seems to go down to zero temperature. Whereas experimentally, there's some indication that's all the way down to zero. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know how reliable that fact is. Do you mean the experimental fact? Yeah, experimentally, that it goes to zero. I mean, because you cannot, uh, you know, uh, firstly, you see, uh, the resistivity, linearity is measured in, uh, for example, at, uh, in a rather low temperature range. Suppose you measure it in a very low temperature range. Then uh, these are typically sort of uh, uh, q superconductors. So either you kill their superconductivity or they are overdoped and therefore they are not superconducting. Uh, in either case, uh, I mean, if, for example, you kill their superconductivity, you have to be sure that uh, the way you have killed it doesn't do anything. Even the non superconducting state in a field has linear interior resistivity down to zero temperature. That itself is a fact that. Uh, yeah, but all right. I mean, that depends on. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, okay, I, I don't think there is a very clear uh, experimental uh, sort of uh, um, forceful result that it goes to zero. Or do you think so? I would tend to agree with you, but I, what I would say that there is definitely data that near optimal doping, it can go down to much lower temperatures. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if you look at the data near optimal doping, uh, the resistivities are measured, let us say, beyond, let us say, 100 degrees or 50 degrees or something. And then if you extrapolate, then you get a very, very small value, which may be even be zero. Yeah, it is. certainly seems to be uh, some minimum temperature, very low something. Is possibly could be, but uh, I would like to say that uh, uh, this occurs in uh, regions of uh, hole doping or whatever for Q plates, uh, which are well beyond the um, quantum critical point. And whether the effect of the quantum critical point persists over such a ra wide range of hole doping and such a wide range of temperatures, uh, what is the mechanism? Why it is not clear. Okay, any other question? Okay, so if not, let's thank TVR.